Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read the passage of Scripture before us. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come down before your feet. They will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your reward or your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. And my new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Very powerful. Maybe, maybe you have some questions. Some things have, have, have caused you to think about some things. Let's go ahead now and let's, let's look at each one of these here and let's just talk through it. So verse 3, verse 7, I, I hope we're, we're seeing a, a, a pattern here. What are your observations? What are the commands? What are the descriptions? They're describing uh, Jesus as, you know, the judge, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut. Great. So let's just, let's just do this here. So first we have this this description of, this is a description here, and it's describing the words. And then who is this person here? This is the person who has the key of David, right? So you're saying, so you're saying that this is number one, this is Jesus, and this is Jesus as as judge and so it's not it's it's not um this is a further description so we'd also want to say judge and king maybe because it's the key of david right so we could say judge slash king he opens the doors that no one will shut and he shuts doors that no one can open you're making that observation what, what do these actions imply? He is a supreme. Okay, supreme, or we could he say so he's, he's, he's sovereign, right? Or we could say that he is in control. That's what's being stated here. He is in complete control. So his, his power is ultimate. His power is supreme. I like what you, the word you said. His power is supreme. So notice here, I'm not focusing. This would be this would be power, or this would be power. This would be authority. Does everyone see the, the difference here? The authority is he has the keys. Someone can have the keys, but it's not doesn't mean anything, right? The, the, these are action statements. Is everyone tracking there with me? These are action statements. So he is he is sovereign over, over everyone else. I hope everyone can see that. People will talk about different people in control, but the, the reality is, is that Jesus is in complete control. He's the one that opens, he's the one that opens a door that no one can close. He's the one that closes a door that no one can open. So his will, his will will not be frustrated by man is the big takeaway. Just before we move on, I'll just highlight some things before. So this is, the, this is a command here. And they're writing, they're writing the words of Jesus. And it's being written to, again, the one, this is the object or we could say recipient. But it's going to the church. No, notice how it's the church it's the church in Philadelphia. That was the name, the church in Philadelphia. Think about that. Think about the name. You know, we have all these different names for our churches, but here it's just 
the church in Philadelphia. It's just interesting if you think about it. The key of David was mentioned in Isaiah 22, 22. Yeah, okay. No, that's good. I had a note there and I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about that. So can you read that, Pastor? And I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. He was talking to about uh, Eliakim, the son of yeah. Hilkiah. Can you read that one more time? Just read it one more time. I'm going to start in 20, okay? Okay. In that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Okay, good. So what what how do we connect this with what's being said? Because it seems that Jesus is literally quoting, he's literally quoting what is what is what Yahweh describes Iliakim, the son of Hilkania. Okay. And so what what if, if we have a proper understanding of interpretation, it's not, Ilya Kim is then functioning as a type that, that, that is pointing to Christ. Does that, is everyone tracking there with me? We could say he is a picture. He is a picture pointing to the greater, the one who will be given the, the key of David in the yet distant future that actually can do this on a, both with life and death, not just physical, but eternal. And how do we know that this is, this is the greater, this is the greater reality? How do we know that? Where in the previous context do we have keys being mentioned? Anyone, anyone, anyone want to, to look at it? Anyone want to share? Oh, the key of death and Hades? Yeah, the key of death and Hades. Where is that? Do you, do you have that passage for us? I think it's Revelation 1. Yeah, 118. Some, some people, I was looking at the commentators, some people actually say that here G, Jesus is filling the role of Yahweh, and then the, the, the church is filling the role of Israel. And so that's the connection. I do think reading, reading the context, it seems that, that God is giving the keys of David to Jesus, his son, and then his son is exercising control. That's what it seems to be going on here. And if we have a proper understanding of typology that in the Old Testament, there are types that point to greater realities. There are shadows that point to greater realities that are to come. So like the Passover lamb is a type of the coming lamb of God. The physical temple, the physical tabernacle is, is, the, is a type pointing to the, to the divine presence coming ultimately, literally on earth to dwell with men, also in, in Christ. And so here we have yet another type Ilya Kim is, is a type pointing to the, the greater coming of this Davidic person, the, the Davidic offspring, who will exercise the key of David with complete authority and power. So, and Jesus is saying that he's fulfilling that, okay? Um, great connection. And, the, and also the description of Ilya Kim, he says in verse 21, he will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem yeah, yeah, and to yeah, the yeah, people yeah. of Judah. So it's no, like he has a good. big responsibility, you know? Yeah, so he, 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 is, he is to be a father. The father who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. Also, he's clothed with a robe. Who else is clothed with a robe, right? He's clothed with a robe. Does everyone see that? He's clothed with a robe. He has a sash, he has a sash, and he has authority. So where do we see that with being described as someone else? In verse there, 13 of chapter 1. Yeah, so we have, this is the vision of Christ. Revelation 1, 1, uh, 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 11. 13. Yeah, okay, in verse 13, yeah. But it's that whole vision, yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a type. So Ilya Kim is, is a type, an Old Testament type, pointing to this greater coming in, in the literal truest sense of, of the Messiah, um, 
the Messiah uh, fulfilled in Jesus. Really good. Uh, I'll just add one more thing. The faithful, the holy one and true one is, is describing Jesus most probably as he is in, in one five as the faithful witness. Okay. So that's going to be helpful because, because in being a faithful witness, he also suffered. He also suffered at the Jewish hands. Everyone see that? So in many ways, this is almost the same as, this is incredibly similar to the Church of Smyrna, correct? In the Church of, Smyr in the Church of Smyrna, their suffering in Jesus relates and also says that he's in sovereign control as, as, as a, a way of, of assuring them. Okay, great. Let's go to verse number eight. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Sounds very similar to what we've seen in the past. They're showing some per perseverance. We can say here that he knows his, his, their works, right? And then Almost also- like he, he's proud of them for, the, for, their, for what they've done. Almost as if this is, so the works are keeping his word and not denying his name. And we, we know that this is also internal. How do we know that this is both internal and external? How can we know that? Comparing this with other, other messages to other churches. How do we know it's both internal and external? What do you mean by uh, internal external? So these so these works this 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 endurance this not denial of his name this keeping his word is not just something that that they're doing externally that conflicts with their heart. Maybe internal because they kept his word. Yes. No. Absolutely. Because because be, so this so this keeping here this would include this here includes both heart. Word, oops, heart, word, and deed, right? So Jesus commands us to be committed in our hearts. He commands us to have pure hearts. He commands us to have pure speech and pure actions, okay? And we, can, we know that this is across the board because what church had outward works, but inwardly they, they left their first love? <laughs> but I'm thinking of Ephesus, right? Ephesus? Ephesus had outward works, but inwardly they left their first love. So what I'm trying to say is that if this was just an external perseverance, he would have called them on their internal failure because we have an example of that in Ephesus. So here we see that this church is faithful both inwardly and outwardly. Hey Tim, also when, uh, when he said, I know, I know that you have, or I know your works, they can, never, they can never deny it because he said he's the true one. Yeah. No, that's so really he, good. So this is, yeah. So he will never lie. And then he kind of affirmed his power of the key because he said, I have placed before you an open door that no one is able to close. Hey, Tim. Um, yeah. Can you comment on the phrase uh, little power? What does that mean? You have but little power. There's, there was, they were asking what this means here. The, the commentators debate on what this means here. So, so what does this mean? And I think this is, this is, this is referring to, this would be referring to physical ability in, in the context of their persecution, right? So they, so. Most churches have very little power against the state, against, this could be against, this could be concerning uh, culture, uh, culture, um, views, political power. This is all physical. What about, what about pagan pressures? Yeah, so that's within the culture. That's within the culture. So this would be, this would be, uh, what, 
So when I talk about culture, so culture, when we think about culture in its most fundamental, we can just speak of culture being like dress, but when, but, but when like anthropologists speak of culture, they're speaking about worldview. So it's, so it's a person's worldview, their belief structure, their religion. And then a lot of that is then in their, their outward practice that involves family. So this is the whole, this is religion, religion, um, social, economic, their views, or we could say perspectives. So that would, that would be comprehensive. So culture, and, and then this could also be political, political power. They have very little, they have very little political power in their local context. And I think that's what he's referring to. They, they have very little power to affect their outward state. Raul, I think I think that's what he's referring to. But but even though they have very little outward power, they, they have remained faithful to, to what Jesus has has said. Um, let me see what the other views are because there's other positions here. Let me just let me read some other positions because maybe you would not like that. The NIB says limited strength or little strength. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's that's that that that's as well. Yeah, little power, little strength. The, the word is the word is power. So it's the it's that classic word power or energy, dunamis. So it could be strength or power. So ESV says power. Yeah, I think it's still in the context of their outward situation. They're very limited in what they can do, right? So is that is that physical strength or is that or is that like cultural, cultural, political strength? Like like what does he mean? How do we define that? Is, so I guess what I'm trying to say is this is this literal or figure, figurative? I'm saying it's more figurative in a context of their influence in the culture, in society, their influence in politically. Maybe because maybe they don't have that much influence in the society and the pressure yeah. or persecution, you know, because the government is over and above them, you know, the religious community. Is have more authority over them, but despite the fact they have remained and they uh, remain faithful. Yeah, yeah no, the, I uh, yeah, I like that. All, all the odds are against them, kind of thing. No, I I like I like that phrase, little influence in society. So I like this. I like what Pastor Noel just said. I think that's probably little influence in society. I think that's probably a very good catch phrase or a phrase describing what little power means. Influence in society, I really like that because that, that includes political, that includes culture, society. It's, it's, the, whole, it's the whole shebang. So I, I, I like that phrase. I th let's, let's go with that phrase. Okay, moving along here, we have, uh, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. So this here is just, we talked about this before. This is referring to, this is referring to the physical Jews, but not spiritual Jews. Everyone tracking there with me? It's referring to physical Jews, not spiritual Jews, right? Because, and this is the description here. They say they are Jews, but are not and lie. <laughs> so if ever there's a, there is a, clarification here. So this really comes back to who are the true people of God? Is it physical Jews or is it those that really put their faith in Jesus? And we have to say it's those that really put their faith in Jesus. There is no hope for a Jew unless he puts his faith in Jesus. There is no salvation for the Jew unless they put their faith in Jesus. So a Jew that is one physically, he is from this, the loins of Abraham, but never puts his faith in Jesus Christ will never be saved. Okay, so this kind of pushes against some, some views, maybe in, in evangelicalism, which will say there's always a place for, for, um, for Israel. And we would say yes, if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. If they do not accept the Messiah, they will not be saved. So everyone's tracking there. Maybe that's maybe a little bit more hot button issue in evangelicalism, but it's very clear. If they do not put their faith and trust and submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, they will, they will, they will experience damnation. This is the gospel. 
they will experience eternal damnation. So just by way of their, their ethnic origin does not exempt them from the call to, to believe and submit. When, when will this happen? When will, behold, I will make them come down and bow before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. When does this happen? This is a promise. When do you think this happens? When he returns. Yeah. Now this is this is a reference to this is a return this is a reference to the return and judgment of nations. And specifically we saw in the in the church to Sardis, or is it or is it Thyatira? Maybe it's Thyatira, this idea that the church reigns with Jesus. Does everyone see that? The church reigns with Jesus. Verse 10, again, very debate as well. Look at this. So there is a reason here. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance. So this comes back to 1, 9, right? The three components of, of, of partnership are affliction, or tribulation, endurance, and kingdom. So here we're, we're picking up on the endurance, the endurance partnership, endurance here. And this is a reason. Because you have kept my word, I will keep you. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. And so that we could say here, this is a reference to the great tribulation. You know, people debate this, but I think this is the most fair. Even if there's earlier, even if there's like foreshadowing or partial fulfillments of tribulation, we see that present day. Ultimately, it's looking to this great hour of tribulation. Now, did did the church, did did the church of Philadelphia literally experience this great hour of tribulation, this great tribulation? Did they experience it? Yes or no? No, right? So this really, this really opens our eyes to see that these messages are pointing to the church in general. Is everyone tracking there with me? That, that, that these words are to be applied not just to the church of Philadelphia, but to the church in general. And in Jesus' mind, he's seeing this as going beyond even, even the local church commands to the local church. And we know that because we've already established that the seven churches also symbolize the church as a whole. So I just want to remind us that seven churches are pointing to the church as a whole. So we can apply these things in our situation. Okay. Now, what does it mean? I will keep you from the hour. So this is another promise. Many people will say that this is a reference to the rapture. What's really interesting here is that Jesus does, there is a word for rap to be caught up. So number one, Jesus does not use this word for raptoro, which is Latin for coming from the Greek, which means to be caught up. Okay, so the word is not used. The reference is this action of keeping. So in keeping... This doesn't really deal with removal, but protection. This concerns uh, protection. And so the question we have to ask is, is there, a parallel, is there a parallel passage that deals with this idea of protection? And there's one other parallel passage in the entire scripture, John 17, 15. John 17, 15. This is the great high priestly prayer of Jesus. Let me turn there really quick. Let me, let me begin in verse 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated me because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. So Jesus is praying, not that they're removed from the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So this is, this is absolutely important and it's the exact same word. It's the exact same context. Um, 
I ask that you not take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. And so keeping is a reference to, to uh, supernatural protection. And it's, and it's concerning the, the tribulation. So they are, they are not going to experience the wrath of God. And this is connected with the promise. Here, it's now a promise. Whereas if you were under judgment, I am coming soon would be a warning, right? Here, it's a promise because the hope is that when he comes, they're going to, they're going to experience joy and relief from persecution. So it really depends on your perspective. So this is a promise, number one. This is a promise, number two. Then we have the last statements here. We have, a, um, we have a command. There's a command here to hold fast. What are you holding fast to? This sounds like works. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may, so that no one may seize, your, seize your crown. This, this sounds like work, work salvation. There you go, work salvation. Hold fast as no one will, will, see, will seize your reward. What are you holding fast to? Yeah, so this, so we could hold fast could be a, another word that we could use is faith. So have faith in what? Yeah, so we could say, we could say it's not antithetical. You could say Jesus or in this context, his words. It's, it's the same. You can't, you can't split them up, right? So this comes back to a, the perseverance and preservation of the saints in scripture, the truth we, we don't have time to go there, but we could go to 1, 16 to 17. You could go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. And this is the idea of that, that our salvation, we receive our justification at the point in time that we exercise saving faith, okay? But that saving faith, which is being powered and and propelled by the spirit living within us is ongoing so that so that Paul Paul will always talk about holding fast to what you have believed holding fast to the gospel not standing on the gospel re remaining fast so this is this is a true this is a true warning that we have to hold fast to Jesus if we are to receive the reward of life we are to have faith in him. Yeah, that sounds good, uh, Pastor Tim. But I was thinking, uh, when I read that, it, it's almost like it's, it, he's saying, you know, continue what you're doing. You're, you're doing a good yeah. job. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's just, it's just keep doing what you're doing. You're exactly right. It's because up here, up here, he's already said that you have, you have kept, you have kept my word. And you have not denied my, my name. So you're right. It's, it's essentially keep doing what you're doing. Continue to hold fast to my, to my word and don't deny my name. That's it. That, that, that's exactly it. Keep on keeping on. The, the, last, the last thing we have here is this promise. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. So think about these promises. I will make him. He will never go out. And I will write on him the name of my God. So think about this. These people are going to be, this is the, this is the house. We could say temple of God is house of God. House of God. Everyone tracking there with me? It's house of God. He will never go out. And then on top of that, God's name will be on him. Right? So think about Assurance, assurance one, assurance two, assurance three. Let me just add here so it's not, it doesn't look bad. Assure two, assure three. The one who conquers. And so this is, this here is a reference to kingdom language overcoming. So you have, so here, in this, in this letter to the church, right, you have, you have three ideas here. You have affliction or persecution. You have endurance. 
and you have kingdom. So we're really coming back to this one nine theme of kingdom, perseverance, and affliction. Oh, and then there's also the, the I, I missed this part here. There's also the name of the city of my God. So assurance number four, <laughs> it's so powerful. I'm sorry, and my own new name. <laughs> oh my goodness. Assurance number five, this is a description here. So this is so powerful. I was just wondering why he refers to my God. Why does he say my God? Uh, I know where you're going with that. No, no, I don't, I'm, I'm just wondering. I don't know why he's saying that. I have no idea why. In the incarnation of Jesus, he would refer to God as his God. Okay. That doesn't deny or remove the, his divinity, but it could, it's emphasize, it's accenting his response from his human perspective, okay? There is this father-son relationship. So there is this that we can speak of. And so more accenting his, his humanity part when he says that, just, just as if when he talks about I thirst or, or those, other, those other things, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's still emphasizing his humanity, but it doesn't deny his divinity, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously as incarnate son, I can see that, but here he's actually, you know, resurrected back up to heaven. So uh, that's why it's a little bit stranger to me that he would say my God here, you know? Yeah, no, I, I can, I can see that. Let me think about that more. Maybe I can have a better answer for you. Um, you know, I still just think anticipating that anticipating my, my Jehovah's witness friend. Is that's, what ask that's what I was saying. That's what I was saying. That's what no, absolutely. That's, that's what I was thinking about as well. Yeah. Why doesn't he say my father? He could have said my father. And so there, it, is there a difference between my God, my father? Um, let me think about that a little bit. Well, it's more the fact that he's doing it now as it, as the resurrected, you know, that's the, I guess that's the question I have more than, you know, if he was still on earth as, as, you know, the son, I could see it more, but now that he's resurrected, that's where I, I'm wondering about it. But well, he's, so he's still, but, so he's, but he's still forever a, a human, right? So he's still for, he forever now has the human nature. So there's two components to Jesus. There's two aspects of his nature that we cannot deny. He's a hundred percent God, a hundred percent man. So we should still expect, expect him to be carrying out human type functions because he is human. So it's not that he's now God alone. He's also speaking to humans. So he wants to relate to humans. Yeah. So he wants, uh, right? yeah. No, and, and that, that could also be, that could also be, we, we have here, so we could add human, human nature and also, but so I would say this, the big takeaway, Silvio, this is a big takeaway. We've already strongly supported the truth in unequivocally that he is God from the earlier context, right? So this is a classic example. There are some texts in scripture that clearly it's uncontrovertible that he is God. There's other texts that he is man. And so the way we synthesize the two is by the two natures, the divine mystery. He is 100% God, 100% man, okay? So if we were to make the inference, oh, this must be a reference that he's just a man, then you've just created a massive error in scripture. So that's where the rub comes in. This is accenting his, 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 human, his human side. And so we could even say, yeah, that's, that's accenting his human side. We agree with the Jehovah's Witness that there is a human side of Jesus, but they still are rejecting the God, the, the, the divine part. That's where the rub comes in. Both in the incarnation and in the exaltation, he is forever the God man. Okay. And so, and so if he is forever, the God, man, we would expect there to be statements that describe his humanity still and still describe his divinity. So actually in my, from my perspective, this is actually even a stronger proof or, or the, or that the only other possibility Silvio is that the word of God is no longer in, uh, in inerrant. It has a mistake. Okay. That's the only other possibility. So what I would say to a Jehovah's Witness is that, yes, this is, this is emphasizing his humanity part. So you're not accepting the divine part. So then this is the options. He's either, he's either the, the scripture is either wrong 
or both of these are true. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say the scripture is in inerrant. Oh, he's only a man. Oh, we're just going to ignore these divine parts. Oh, see, I'm accenting the human parts. That's where the rub comes in. So they can't hold alongside Jesus is only a man and the scripture is inerrant. You can't hold those two true. That, that's, that's, that's impossible. So maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's an answer. I don't know. Let me think about it more and I, I'll try to get an answer back to you. I, I do want to emphasize here, we'll end on this, is that this is emphasizing that if they persevere, there, there, is, there is no way that they're going to be ever separated from God. This here is, fo- this all is focusing upon divine presence. He will be a pillar in, in, in the house of God. He will never go out from the house of God. He will have God's name on him. And actually in the Old Testament, the presence of the name of God also signified the presence of God himself. So where God's name was, God's presence was. So in writing on him the name of my God, not only does it signify that God, God possesses him, he's, he's possessed and owned by God, but also that God is present with him, okay? The name of the city of, God, of his God further accents that he is in the presence of God and then Jesus says, and my own, my own new name. So, so again, this here seems to be emphasizing more of Jesus' divinity. Because you would never equate, if Jesus was just a man, this is blasphemous. To include both of these would be just, who cares about Jesus' name? If he's just a man, all you care about is, is the name of God. That he's the most powerful person. So my own name being equated with the name of my God, I think is also quite interesting. You would not, it's not a, a, the name of a man that's being put there. It's the name of, of Christ, the exalted risen Lord. And then again, the last statement here is this call to, this is a call to action. On the phrase, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. Yeah. Are, are, these, are these two different places or are these one in the same place? Yeah, so we're going to see that the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, that's at the end of Revelation, and it is, it is the same. So the whole point of this, the, the, the new Jerusalem descending, right? So it seems to be separate from heaven. At the same time, Christ, God is coming with it. So God sits in the new Jerusalem on earth. And so I don't think out of heaven, the kingdom of, of heaven is God's dwelling place. So it's... So the accent here on out of heaven is just is just uh, proximity or or place, if, if that's making sense. This is focusing on proximity or place. It's not distinguishing between the two because God dwells in heaven; His kingdom is in heaven. So when the Jerusalem is descending, it's just signifying it has to come from somewhere. Do we yeah, I can hear you. I'm still I'm still thinking. So the the new Jerusalem. Is the final place. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. N- n- yeah. The new Jerusalem coming down from heaven is it's this, it's, it's the, the heavenly Jerusalem. So it's also referred to as the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the, the heavenly, the, 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 the city of our God. Okay. It would be like saying, okay, this is just, this is just, we're, we're all Americans here. So I'm not, I'm not anyway trying to be like colonial or anything like that. It's only an analogy. It would be like saying New York city or Washington, D.C. is coming to the Philippines. So in one sense, if, if you're literally, if it's moving to, to here, there is a movement from the U.S., but the whole implication is that the Philippines is becoming the U.S. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it, you, you wouldn't, so heaven is heaven because of the presence of God. <laughs> How can I say that? Um, the, the city represented, let me just, in, in ancient, that's why you, you had the Roman Empire, but it's the city of Rome. Rome represented the Roman Empire. For us, we kind of distinguish between a city and a country. Whereas in the, in the first century, the city was representative of the country. So you could take all the lands of Rome, but until you took that city, Rome was still there. If you took all the, if you took all of the, the country of the US, if it was just taken over by China or Germany, Germany or Russia, even if that city still existed, you wouldn't call it, it would, it would be 
it would it would have surrendered. It, it's a different. It's conceptually, it's different. Is that is that maybe a better analogy? I can follow that. It's just the the words that comes down as the one that's so transitive and it's kind of. No, okay. So this is. Confused. Let me just. Let, let me just. Let me just. I'm going to be clear here. So let, let me just. Let me just be clear. So this is this is profound. It's yeah. So imagine here you have you have heaven. You have heaven and and you have the throne of God, right? And then here you have the earth. Okay. In in Genesis, you had the earth created, and then you had you had the you had the garden, right? The Garden of Eden. Let's just say here that you have the you have the Garden of Eden, and then God, and then God would come down and dwell with man. Okay. Uh, walk. He would walk walk with man okay that's how the original but but his dwelling place was was in heaven okay but he would come down he would come down and dwell with man okay the goal of redemptive history the goal of of god's plan is to actually come down is to bring his throne down to earth and dwell with men so so if you're still thinking like this is heaven, the whole point is that there's going to be this unification of heaven and earth, and God dwells with us. Is that is that making sense? Is that making better sense? And he carried me away to the spirit, verse 10, 21, verse 10, to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Okay, so again... It's coming down out of heaven from God, but God's not staying there because then in, in chapter 22, I mean, chapter 21, verse 22, he says that there is no temple in this city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like he's seeing the temple, the, the city coming down from heaven, from God, from heaven. But then in the very next verse, set of verses, he's saying that God is in the city, and there's no more temple because God is the temple himself. So the whole point being is that um, God is dwelling with men. Okay, I, th I, th I think we're going to see that more clearly as this as it climaxes in Revelation, but that is really the big context. And I think you're really picking up on something revolutionary, Raul, is this idea that we typically think of, we typically think of heaven being different from earth. And the ultimate goal of us is to be with God in heaven forever, but that's only temporary because God's plan is for him to come down and dwell with his creation, which is just such a, a more profound, a more amazing truth that God would c condescend and dwell with us. That is so much more profound. I can, I can accept that. And, I, and also I'm, I'm, I'm comforted uh, in the meantime, until I learn more, that we are doing, as you said, the uh, apocalyptic interpretation or the symbol, symbol, symbolic yeah. interpretation of Israel. And that symbolic is literal too, right? So it's going to happen literally one day. So it's, but you're, you're picking up on this idea that because there is symbolism, there is a lot of symbolism here. So, so great. Raul, think about that. We'll talk about this more. Um, I think one big concept to think about is that we have to imagine in the first century, the country was represented by the city. The city, the city was the country, and then that land always increased or decreased. But 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 the city was the country itself. For us, it's 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 we see it seems to be separated. We view the country of the Philippines, the country of the U.S., as separate from cities within the country. But in the first century, and even pre and post. It was the city that represented that that was the country. Okay, let's let's let's. I just want to end on one thing here: is this this call to he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so, this is for us. I want you to hear these words. I want you to to read them, and I want you to believe in them. And so, here the call to action is: if we are in a situation of persecution. Right now we're not, but we could be, that we are called to keep, not to compromise, to keep the word of, of Jesus, the words of Jesus, 
and we're, we're called to um, both to, to proclaim those words and to hold fast to those words. And we have this assurance that one day, right now we have the Spirit dwelling with us. One day, God the Father, God the Son, their dwelling place will be with us on earth. And, and we will be pillars in his temple. We will have his name on us tattooed. <laughs> They'll be tattooed. They'll be tattooed on us or, or something like that. I don't know how to look. Um, but I really want us to be thinking about this. This should, should, this should give us incredible motivation to keep on doing what we're doing, to be humble, to walk humbly before our God. And so I just really want to encourage us with this.